Okay, uh, so your third assignment is done, was a little bit more challenging, right, than the other ones. Um, I do want to ask you for this one, would it be helpful that we comment the solutions in the uh, in the class with you? Or you feel like, okay, you've figured out what's going on and that would be redundant. Maybe raise your hand if you would like to see how we went about uh, implementing this. All right, overwhelming, yes. All right, so I will, uh, once we are done with grading, I will um, keep some time to go uh, over the solutions. I will likely ask one of the TAs to uh, do that for me. Um, okay, good. Um, so now, um, just to kind of remind you where we are in the course, we have, you know, gone way long way from going from the basics of machine learning and deep learning, then we started to go into components important for large language models, and then eventually we build to what large language models are. And now we are in this part of the course, we are shifting uh, toward the you know, what people are thinking about today when they are using and deploying these kinds of uh, models for various applications. Uh, and one of the topics we are currently focusing on is efficiency. These models are very large. They have very number of parameters and this consequently results in a very big requirements for the GPU memory and uh, GPU memory is quite limited. So Last time uh, we had a guest speaker that taught us about quantization, which is the process of converting to a higher precision uh, uh, floats into a lower precision representation of numbers such that we can store more of these numbers on our available uh, GPUs. And to do that, we have used these formulas where we started from uh, what is the scale of the numbers we have in our weight matrices, and then we converted them into this integer representation. Uh, one term that I want you also to uh, remember that wasn't maybe mentioned by our speaker is this uh, quantization bin. And that's um, in your continuous values, in your float uh, points, you will have a certain ranges and all numbers in those ranges are going to map to the same quantized integer. So that range uh, will be called quantization bin. So all the continuous values that will map to this uh, integer representation. Uh, another thing I want you to remember is that the scale factor will also be referred to quantization constant or quantization scale. So depending on which paper you read, you might uh, find this uh, term. Okay, and uh, remember why we were talking about that. The size of the model is determined by the number of parameters that model have. And remember what the number of parameters are. First of all, don't confuse it with hyperparameters as some of you have done in your midterm. These are two uh, completely different uh, terms. So hyperparameter refers to these external variables like learning rate, batch size, and so on that you set in your configuration for the model. Parameters or weights are those numbers in weight matrices that we are training with gradient descent and that determine basically what your model is. Uh, so the size of the model is determined by the number of those values we have in those matrices and their precision, right? because depending on which precision we use, we are going to use more or less bits to store all of these weight matrices. So for example, uh, your speaker, Tiani, gave you a formula how to, uh, that converts uh, a given number of parameters of your model in approximately the GPU memory you'll need. Uh, my students, for example, that work do research with me, commonly use LAMA 3.170 billion. And for storing this model in a, uh, 16 bit precision, you will need uh, two 80 uh, gigabyte A100 GPUs. This kind of GPUs are very rare. So, more often you will see something like 40 gigabyte uh, A100s, which would mean that you need four of them. So, you need four of them on the same node, and avail availability of four GPUs that are on the same node, let's say on our CHPC compute is not super abundant. So you likely need to wait way more in your queue to get that node with four A100s with 48 gigabytes of memory instead of having needing only a single uh, GPU, which can be on any uh, node. So the fact that you need so much GPU memory really restricts you in terms of getting resources you need. And then we have learned quantization as a method to reduce the memory requirements while preserving the model's performance. Yes. 
I I I'm not hundred percent sure what I will say is right, but I don't think you can uh, at least using hugging face easily load entire model on across multiple GPUs if they all don't sit on the same node on CHPC. So compute we have here at Utah. Uh, I'm not 100% this is sure, but I'm more sure this is true than uh, this not being uh, true. So I can check this for you, but I'm I'm confident you do really need those. If you need four GPUs, they do need to be on the same node. Yeah. What we do know by any chance, if yeah, I'm loading uh, Lama, Lama 3 70 billion and I need four GPUs, do they all need to be on the same node on CHPC? In your lecture. Okay, all right. Let me let me double check this. I'm pretty sure this is the case because you know students will tell me also like, okay, I need to wait longer in a queue because I'm waiting to get that node with sometimes eight uh, uh, GPUs. Yeah, but double double check this for you. Yeah. Um, okay. For me, do you have a charger? I can. Okay. Let me just put the charger on before this disappears. Okay, so quantization is just a way to reduce the precision. And then because we reduce the precision, we need less GPU memory, less bits per each number we wanna store on memory. So now don't get confused. QE cache is a little, is an independent concept on its own. You will see Q, uh, QE uh, quantization as a term together. But QE cache is a whole other term, independent quantization. And it's just the way of calculating the attention scores in a self-attention uh, mechanism, where uh, when we want to check what are the importances of other tokens, given the uh, token at the position K plus one, we can store some of the values, namely rows or columns in the key and value matrices, and then use those pre-computed vectors to compute the attention score for the uh, key, uh, the value that comes uh, in the future. So it's just a more efficient, uh, excuse me, uh, way to uh, way to write, uh, way to implement self-attention. And then when you use QE cache and quantization together, so you use QE cache, but also you are using quantized weights instead of the full precision weights you get something which is called QE uh, uh, cache quantization. So this is all we talked about last time. However, all of our efficiency discussions so far had focused on, we have a model uh, and we wanna do more efficient the inference from this model. Inference being just using the model at the test time or at the deployment time. However, when I presented you with the options for modeling approaches given classification or generation tasks, I've given you also uh, options to fine tune your model, namely to uh, change its weights from the pre-trained values. So when we do this, we also need to compute the gradients and there is even more memory that we need uh, to do this. So what to do when, how to, how to approach um, fine tuning a model like Lama 3.170 billion uh, given the uh, hardware limits that we have is the question we didn't really talk about so far and something we are going to talk about today. This idea of fine tuning, instead of the fine tuning the entire of a model, instead of doing that, fine tuning only a small um, number of parameters uh, while keeping the rest of your large language models frozen or unchanged is called parameter efficient fine tuning and you will commonly see it under abbreviation PEFT, okay? And there are many, many approaches to parameter efficient fine tuning. This is a wonderful survey I highly recommend where you will see, first of all, categorization into, um, into three main categories and then hybrid approaches. And each one of these has its own approach. So this is a massive area of research. And given that everything is super abundant in the LLM space from number of publications, just last year or last couple of years, there was explosion of how to do more efficient fine tuning of large language models. Of course, you can imagine that we won't cover all of this. Um, we will cover just this one algorithm uh, called LoRa today. 
And you will see Laura here, if you can see, well, I don't know whether this is tiny, it goes under this category of uh, what's called reparametrized fine tuning. Okay, so we're gonna talk about LoRa first. Then we are going to talk about its even further improved version Q LoRa, which is more or less state of the art for people are using today. So when I ask my students, hey, please fine tune this model. I want you to use the biggest one you can. They will go ahead and use Q LoRa, which is, as you can imagine, nicely integrated with the Hugging Face ecosystem. Then we'll see where are we, what time there is left. I'm, I suppose we'll have um, like maybe half of the lecture time left. We are going to start diving into two applications. Um, so far, they sprinkle applications along the way. For example, you have been implementing sentiment classification, which is an NLP uh, application. Uh, we have been talking about machine translation when, when I introduced sequence to sequence model, that's also an NLP application. When we did prompting, we framed it as a question answering format. Again, uh, there is some kind of application there. Along the way, when I talked about example of text generation, I mentioned summarization. So now we are going to, uh, after we are done with efficient uh, fine tuning of LLMs, we are going to start talking about one application in more depth, uh, namely question answering, which is a huge um, collection of tasks rather than one specific task. Then after that, we are going to talk about summarization. And that's more or less as much as I'm going to cover about applications in this course. And along the way of explaining question answering and summarization, I will use the opportunity to talk about some other important topics in this course, such as retrieval augmented generation as another technique uh, of using LLMs. And uh, when we talk about summarization, we are going to go again uh, uh, into how to evaluate text generation, which we touched a little bit when we talked about machine translation with Blue, but we are going to go into uh, more measurements of uh, automatic text generation in contrast to the manual one. So that's what's coming next not just today, but obviously next uh, next week uh, as well. All right, any questions about any of the things I said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. We will come to that, but let's go first into, into LoRa, which is a different different topic. I will come back to your question. All right, so as I said, um, LoRa is just one method for parameter efficient fine tuning. Uh, and it works by uh, taking your pre-trained model's weights. Um, so remember, your, when I say weights, there is just a bunch of matrices, right? Like by now you know what the transformer is and you know there is a lot of repetition of certain blocks and that each one of these blocks is composed on some weights, right? So um, each one of these weights can be um, uh, frozen when you are starting your parameter efficient fine tuning. And with uh, approaches like LoRa, what you're gonna do is you're going to create some kind of low rank representation of those parameters. And then you are going to fine tune that low rank, uh, um, uh, low rank, um, excuse me, representation, which has less parameters than the full weight matrix uh, during fine tuning stage. And then eventually you are going to do some merging of your pre-trained and new, newly found weights to make the final uh, inference, which stands in contrast to, uh, for example, additive theft is a very common one where you, a uh, very common approach with uh, uh, in this, uh, this direction is to introduce so-called adapters which are additional layers in each one of your transformer block. So you can imagine, you know, how you had, you all have by now implemented um, in your third assignment, feed forward layers in your uh, transformer blocks. Imagine now adding a two more or one more uh, such layer and then fine tuning only that specific layer you have introduced. That's very common with this additive theft. But the issue with, the, with additive theft is that it introduces so-called uh, inference latency. Latency is the time it takes for your model, your LLM, to process input and give you the outputs. 
With these additive path approaches, with uh, adding these adapters, basically you are adding more than layers to your network. So mm -hmm. your network just becomes deeper. So because it's deeper and there are more computation involved, it, everything becomes slightly slower. And that's not something uh, that's allowed under these parameter efficient uh, fine tuning um, methods. So the method I'm gonna teach you today, LoRa, is going to be better than these other approaches because is going to match the performance of uh, fine tuning your model fully, but at the same time, it won't introduce these uh, latency issues uh, down the line. Uh, here in this table, uh, this, uh, the point here is that even if you have very small number of parameters, like half a million, which is very small, by adding these adapters that I mentioned with these additional layers, uh, top of each one of your feed forward layers in the transformer can cause uh, the, um, the slowdown in the, at the inference time. So with a very small number of parameters, like half a million, you can get 2% uh, additional uh, slow, slowness in uh, the speed. However, uh, when you have 11 million parameters, which is in the, you know, in the realm of our LLMs, I keep mentioning numbers at least 7 billion, right? Uh, then you get an uh, increase of 20 to 30%, which is obviously not something we want. Like if you are developing a demo like ChatGPT, you want the results to come fast, right? All right, so let's now then understand what the LoRa is. So now I'm introducing you components, which are going to be important to understand this method for parameter efficient fine tuning. And the first concept you actually know from your linear algebra courses, right? The rank of a matrix, which is the maximum number of linearly independent rows or columns in the matrix. So for example, here, what is the rank of this matrix? One, perfect. So you might notice that after each one of the uh, rows, uh, columns here is uh, can be obtained by multiplying the first number with either two, three, four, or five, right? So these are, uh, all of them can be uh, represented in some combination of the first column. Therefore, the rank is only one, right? Okay, there is a result from the prior work that shows that Bait matrices in transformer architecture are actually low rank matrices. And this is important to keep uh, in mind for what comes uh, next. Another, another thing that you have learned in linear, linear algebra that we are gonna use is the idea of rank decomposition, that you can write a matrix, any matrix as the product of two matrices, which are whose shapes are given by the rank of your original matrix. So if you had M by N matrix, you can write it as the product of M by R and R by N matrices. Okay, so for example, here, you can write this matrix I have just shown you as the product of these two uh, vectors because the rank is one. So this is M by one and one by N uh, matrix here. Now, what comes important uh, for our LoRa is to recognize that in the first matrix, you have 25 numbers, right? It's five by five matrix, therefore you have 25 numbers. And if this was the weight matrix, you will have 25 weights contained in this matrix that you need to store. However, each one of these smaller matrices, which are basically vectors, has five values each. So if we are storing just these two smaller matrices, we need to store only 10 numbers in total. And by multiplying these matrices, we can recover the full matrix. And this is the idea behind uh, LoRa, that if we have this rank decomposition, then we need to store less matrices if the rank of this matrix is way smaller than its number of rows or columns, which is the case for the transformer weights. Okay. So now putting everything together, uh, let's go over the uh, LoRa. All right. So first thing you are going to start are your pre-trained LLMs weights, right? And remember, again, here I'm talking as if we have a single weight matrix, 
but we have a bunch of these, right? You, you can imagine you have a set of many, many of uh, these. But now let's talk about LoRa as if we have just a single one of them. You would just repeat the process for every single one of these. So W0 is your pre-trained weight matrix. And when you are fine tuning, um, and it's a, it's a low rank as shown by the prior work. When you fine tune your LLM, what is happening is you are changing each one of these weights in these matrices, right? So you can imagine that once you fine tune a model, each one of these weight matrices can be written as some, as you start with, started with some uh, initial weight matrix, and then you have changed numbers to get to the next fine-tuned matrix. So basically your fine-tuned weight matrix can be written as W0 plus some delta, right? There are some numbers you can add to each value of your pre-trained weight matrix to get to the fine-tuned one. Assumption that the LoRa authors have made then is, well, if the original matrix is low rank, low rank well, we can expect that the fine-tuned one is low rank too. Like we didn't change anything dramatically that now the fine-tuned matrices will become full rank or anything close to it. And empirically they can show that this was the correct assumption to make. Okay, so if the fine-tuned matrix is low rank, then we assume that there is some number R, the rank of these uh, matrices, such that you can decompose them into using this rank decomposition where the smaller matrices will be you know, narrower or shorter in terms of the rows and columns. So you can introduce, um, maybe let me go here. Um, the goal is to represent this delta as a decomposition, the rank decomposition um, with a goal. All right, let me, let me try to collect my thoughts such that this is a clear. Um, we want to fine tune this matrix, but we don't want to fine tune it in a way where we are changing all of its values because that's going to be slow. So instead we are defining the change in the uh, weights to rank the composition. And initially we start with random matrices uh, A and a zero matrix B, and we are going to change A and B, uh, which then their product should give us that delta in the weights. So let's go over this again. You define A to be R times D matrix, assuming that R is way smaller than D. And in this paper, they actually show you can do this well with assuming that the rank is even one. So basically these A and Bs can be only single vectors, right? Uh, where the original matrix, matrix is D square. And when you, you work with something like um, llamas, you will have these uh, D B in thousands. Okay, so, um, I don't know whether I put some any numbers here, but basically if you have um, 12,000 squared, you will get something in millions. If you have um, two, uh, two times D, uh, which would be um, how many values you have if R is one here, then you have, which is something, uh, total number of parameters is way smaller than million. Okay. So you start with a randomly initialized A, you start with a zero for B. The reason we start with zero matrix for B is because initially we want to be at the W zero, which are our pre-trained weights. So if your matrix B is zero, then uh, Delta W is gonna be zero too, right? During fine tuning, you are fine tuning these matrices A and B, which collectively, and I hope I know that the way I tried to represent that argument was a little bit roundabout, but the collectively matrices A and B have less parameters if rank is very small than the original full matrix D squared has. That's my point, right? So because you have way less parameters, then training less parameters obviously is going to lead to faster training and less memory consumption. So. Matrices A and B is what you are fine tuning 
during the fine tuning stage, whereas everything else stays the, the fixed. So the original weights are staying frozen, okay? And then what's important and different from in LoRa than in other works is that because product of B and A is approximating this delta in weights that leads you from the pre-trained weight matrix into the fine-tuned one, then W0 plus B A is basically approximation of the fine-tuned weight matrix. And in the original full transformer, full if we trained the fully uh, transformer fully without any of these approximation, what you would do is take some input x, you will multiply with w to get the hidden representation um, h. And here with LoRa, you are just going to uh, basically do the same. Um, you are going to multiply your inputs both with the frozen w0 and with these uh, uh, product of, of B and A, okay? Because W0 plus B and A is approximating the fine-tuned weight matrix. Okay, so this is Laura. Are there any questions about this? Yes. So where do you get the X from? Um, I can tell you where X comes from. I'm a little bit confused. Why are I asking, do we need to go through every uh, X? So X is just the input, right? When we are fine tuning a model, we need inputs and outputs, right? Sure. Let's say this is sentiment classification. You will start with the movie review. Remember the first layer of transformer is embedding layer where each one of the tokens in your movie review would represent it with token embedding. And then transformer does this sequence of uh, contextualize and nonlinear operations to get the token embedding for each one of them, right? So you can think about X being a representation coming from some layer in your transformer for a given token. Uh, and yes, if you are fine tuning the model, you will have a batch of movie reviews, right? And this will be a certain tensor and you will fine tune the model by calculating the loss on the batch of data and back propagating using the gradient on the, of that batch, right? So X says, yes, you are right. We have uh, many of them. And um, I guess what confused me in your question is uh, the, the quantifier, all of them. Likely you will use all of your training data unless you have any simple task for which maybe you deem 100 examples would be sufficient to get to the performance. Yeah. Why did it Oh, sorry, can you repeat them? Uh, B to B zero. Okay, so when you start, you start from pre-trained weights, right? Because that's what you start with. Uh, if your B is zero, then look what will happen. You will have W zero plus zero times A, which will be zero, and everything times X. So in the beginning, you're gonna start with W X, which makes sense because that's what you start with, right? Like you don't have um, any change of the weights yet if you have just started your fine tuning, right? So in the first batch of data, uh, the best representation you can reasonably get is from the pre-trained weights. Then you get the loss and you back propagate, including B, which will now be changed a little bit and no longer be zero. So in the next batch iteration, you no longer will have W0 here, but W0 plus small change, which it, it just basically approximation of how you would go about fine tuning if you didn't do this funky approximation, right? If you just did the full normal fine tuning, you will start with your pre-trained language model and get whatever you get from it in the first uh, iteration. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know whether it would um, it would matter. Yeah, I suspect not, but I don't I don't see immediately why would, would that cause a change. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this uh, another thing I want to mention is that your A will be uh, initialized from the normal distribution set centered around zero. So even A will have 
a big mass of it center of its value centers close to the zero. So it's not terribly far, far away from zero uh, either. So that's an additional argument for why I think it wouldn't really matter, but again, they can test it easily. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's LoRa. Very important uh, to remember. If you are, you know, now you want to fine tune a language model and you want to get best performance you have, uh, maybe you will get the best performance by taking the large, larger model that you can fine tune if you have just fine tune in a standard way. Uh, you can compare taking a larger, let's say, Llama 3.170 billion and using LoRa to fine tune it. And you can compare that with fine tuning, let's say, Llama 7 billion but not using LoRa rather than standard fine tuning. And you might find that actually, because LoRa should be, be approximation of the standard fine tuning, uh, fine tuning 70 billion model with LoRa should then behave as fine tuning 70 billion model in a standard way, which we know should be better than fine tuning a 7 billion model in general, unless already with 7 billion you peak, uh, you get the highest possible performance. So this is good to keep in mind that uh, you have these two basically approaches uh, to 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 take to kind of try to guess get the best performance possible. Now, that's not it, right? I mentioned QLora. I forgot about this slide, which I want to uh, emphasize. So, as I said, the benefit of uh, LoRa is that collectively in your matrices A and B, you are having way less parameters if rank is really small, like one, which empirically has been shown to be enough, uh, than what you have in the original full matrix. So by fine tuning A and B, instead of fine tuning the original weight matrix, you are finding fine tuning way less parameters, which means that everything is gonna be faster. One detail that probably, uh, uh, you couldn't kind of um, come on your own because maybe you don't have enough experience with these optimizers, is that uh, our optimizer of a choice is very often Adam. And I didn't talk in very, you know, uh, in much detail about Adam, but we do men mention it as a way to uh, kind of um, extend the stochastic gradient descent to also uh, capture the notion of momentum like what is the mean gradient uh, in the previous few steps and what is the variance between them, such as such that if you are stuck in a plateau, you have an opportunity to maybe go back a little bit and try again until you uh, go into uh, a lower direction. So because Adam optimizer is going to also save the mean and variance of gradient and also their bias corrected versions, for all parameters, it is neat to change. It's actually uh, Adam's optimizer state requires a lot of memory. Uh, it's gonna be, if you use PyTorch, it's gonna be a dictionary with all sorts of tensors and these tensors will have a lot of values. And by now we know that each number we need to store is taking a little bit of precious memory, right? So storing, Adam's optimizer state requires a lot of memory. Now think about what happens with LoRa. With LoRa, you are needing to change way less parameters, right? So information of uh, about way less parameters needs to be recorded in the optimizer state. And by just by uh, needing to store, to kind of capture the information about less parameters in the optimizer state, the optimizer state itself will need to require way less memory, which is a huge a benefit. So in a LoRa paper, they say that they, re they reduce uh, the GPU memory, more often known as uh, VRAM, by up to two thirds, which is a huge reduction of the necessary memory. And they tie back uh, this whole a reduction of the memory to uh, Adam's optimizer state. So this is also something to, to remember that your optimizer, uh, you have worked with stochastic gradient descent, maybe just we didn't, I didn't require you to implement Adam. So maybe you don't have that feeling for how much information the optimizer itself might require, but it's actually uh, a lot. Okay, so now let's go into QLoRa. 
Um, LoRa is great, but it could be better. That's the point of QLoRa. So QLoRa, you can think about it as going even further into the efficiency. So first thing QLoRa will do, which you immediately might try to kind of propose yourself as a natural step, is instead of using the original pre-trained weights in their full precision, like 16-bit, we can use the uh, four-bit approximation by using quantized versions of our uh, weights. So QLora first proposes to use four-bit uh, quantized version of the pre-trained LLM. So here, when we when I said W0, uh, you need to start with that, which we'll use eventually. You are still using that, you're still freezing it, but instead of using the full precision, you are using the four-bit quantized version of the pre-trained matrix W0. Okay, so that's the first thing. And now I will give you a high level intuition for the rest of these things. Uh, not, I'm not gonna go into detail. I think this goes beyond uh, this course, but I just wanna, wanna give you a sense of where do you, where else you could save the, the memory or where else things can become um, not only efficient, but more give you better performance uh, than uh, LoRa. So the first thing is this normal float. The issue with quantization is that when you have some outliers in your weight matrices, some numbers that are way higher than other numbers, Usually in practice, this means these numbers, these weights are really important. They capture something, something, something important for the task. However, quantization will be thrown off by that single number. Because remember, we with quantization, we basically do that uh, rescaling of the uh, range of numbers we have in our weights uh, into, into uh, another scale in, in integers. So if one number is completely off, it's gonna throw off the whole quantization because a bunch of other numbers will gonna be mapped to the same quantized values. Although if we had removed that outlier, we wouldn't deem them to be so similar to map them into the same quantized value. So outliers are very important, but they are kind of uh, not handled well by quantization or the default quantization we have used. So something else people have been proposing is so-called block quantization to take your in range of uh, weights that you have in your matrix and then uh, just uh, find intervals, let's say 10 intervals, you just divide them into 10 blocks and then you quantize each block independently with its own quantization, you know, scaling factor and everything else we have. Um, this is good, but the issue with block quantization that this paper is uh, kind of um, uh, raising and then fixing is that um, our weights in our model, prior work, and then they have reconfirmed it, have shown to be normally distributed around zero, which might not surprise you because you know about layer normalization where we actually force the values to be centered around zero with variance of one, right? So we know that, and you can read the paper where they have in the appendix, the whole uh, ex uh, uh, set of experiments proving this, that the weights of transformers are normally distributed around zero, which means that most weights are going to be some number around zero. A lot of them will be there. And then some few of them will gonna be sprinkled farther apart around one or minus one. So if you do block quantization, uh, then basically what you are um, kind of ignoring is that not all quantization bins should have the equal probability of getting the values. Some bins should have less numbers uh, associated with, with them because there are simply less values in the continuous range associated with that bin. And in this paper, QLoRa, they introduced this normal float. And now things get a little bit more hairy and I don't wanna go into the depths of that because we will take this whole lecture. But basically they integrate this observation that the weights of the transformer are normally distributed around zero. So if we wanna do block quantization, not all blocks should be equally wide basically. This is what they do. 
And that's going to be better to handle these out, uh, outliers. OK, so that's the first thing they, are gonna, they, they did. They uh, introduced this normal float, which uh, is, you can think about it as a quantization scheme that's better for quantizing transformer weights because they are normally distributed around 0, and this quantization scheme handles that. Now, the other stuff, the other two will be quicker to explain. They do double quantization. So remember that uh, now we have these blocks. Uh, basically, to quantize a single weight matrix, we divide it into blocks. And each block is quantized for itself, which means that each one of these blocks have its own uh, quantization scale or constant, right? And these are also additional numbers you need to store somewhere. And they say, well, let's store these numbers also in a lower precision, right? And this is something maybe that kind of you can't imagine immediately because we forget how many of these matrices there are in transformer, right? Like there is so many of them. And then if you each one of them is further divided into blocks, then each one of them is associated with certain number of these constants. And across the whole of the transformers, that's a lot of quantization constants or a lot of numbers to memorize. And they propose, well, also quantize those uh, to save the memory. And the final thing is so-called page optimizer. Again, this issue with our Adam optimizer, this state being uh, requiring a lot of memory. So if you have long inputs, your processing longer inputs will require more memory. And they will result in a memory spike, right? If you have input which is way longer than your average input in your data, it will require way more memory. And therefore, there will be spike in the memory consumption. What they propose in this paper is to handle these longer inputs by observing when they will occur. And when they occur, you are going to transfer the atom optimizer state temporarily to CPU from your GPU, they are going to process your long input. And when it's done with processing long input, some memory will be free. And when that happens, you are going to map your optimizer state back to the GPU. OK? So these are three, uh, three improvements, plus proposing to use quantized versions of your pre-trained LM that QLaura had introduced. I'll show you something extremely ugly now, but I just didn't have bandwidth to make it prettier. But if these are screenshots for the paper. This is their uh, their uh, Q. Uh, excuse me. This is their LoRa uh, formula. So X uh, W right. So X is the input W or original pre-trained weights uh, plus uh, then X plus these L one L two are what they, I was calling A and B right. And ignore this number S uh, for uh, entirely for now. OK, so this is their LoRa equation that you have seen before. And not everything is going to be clear now when I show you this equation, but I will try to just map the differences. OK, as promised, very ugly, right? But this is the equation that's basically should be the same as this equation. So equations 5 and 3 in spirit are the same things, except that we are using this uh, quantized versions of these matrices and different uh, things. So you have your X, which is your input, and you use the B float 60, which is a good precision to use. And now look at what's different. Here, we are going to, instead of using the full precision for our W, we are going to use this, what they call N4, uh, NF, excuse me, NF4, which is that normal float that I have just told you, right? Double dequant just means, well, quantize this uh, weight, as you see it here, but then also quantize the uh, quantization constants that we also have uh, learned uh, about. And then, of course, in this equation, you won't observe the page optimizer because that's not part of this equation. So my point here by showing you equation three and five is to say they are doing LoRa, but the weights are now quantized and you have these further improvements for the quantization. And that's basically what is changed 
uh, with uh, Q LoRa. Okay, so that's as much as I wanna say about efficient fine tuning. Uh, we have learned about LoRa, which is just one of the methods for parameter efficient uh, fine tuning done by taking your pre-trained matrix and doing the rank decomposition, but you are learning the matrices involved in the rank decomposition, then in total have less parameters associated with them than the original uh, matrix. And then QLoRa is just introducing quantization into the LoRa schema and making everything even more efficient, okay? Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. How, like, how much do we trust the prior work that these matrices are really low rank and that indeed are the rank of the matrix that we are trying to approximate with rank decomposition is truly so low rank that this all of this phase off. So this has been shown empirically. They had all shown that these matrices are low rank. And then by doing LoRa and through a bunch of experiments across models and data sets, they show that you can match the performance of the standard fine tuning with the LoRa fine tuning. So the evidence is empirical, right? But you could be right that eventually you have a pre-trained LM that doesn't exhibit low rank uh, matrices and this then wouldn't work. So um, I think it, there are always these two options. You have certain GPU memory, right? And you know, you can calculate what's the size of the model that I can uh, fine tune without any of these efficient fine tuning stuff on my hardware. So let's say that number is 7 billion. Then you can fine tune that model and get the performance out. But maybe you are, um, you are aware now that you could use LoRa and fine tune even larger model on the same hardware. So you push that, right? You also run the experiment where you fine tune, let's say 70 billion version, but with LoRa. And then you get a uh, performance for one approach and the other, and you compare them. And depending on what's higher, you will use that model. So a lot of what we do is empirical, right? Um, I think given the evidence we have in uh, from the literature, uh, using LoRa with larger model will likely be the better option. But we have a habit of over-experimenting, right? Like I would run both of these options just to make sure, yeah. Okay, very well, um, that's it. Um, I am very close to releasing the fourth uh, assignments where you will be exploring quantization and, uh, uh, and LoRa for first question answering uh, task. So you will see a little bit of this for yourself using the hugging face uh, ecosystem. All right, it's